All right. So today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about contracts. Um, as I said, there are two major things, and kind of as we're looking through the fundamentals of um, construction law and law in general, that will be important for you guys uh, in your practice when you get out there. The most important on the legal side is contracts. And um, it will be relevant in all of the work you do, although it will always be kind of in the background. You, when, when you first get into um, a project and your, your initial work, you're going to create a, a scope of services identifying, okay, we're going to be designing for you a house or a factory or, or whatever the hospital, whatever the project might be. And you'll identify, um, you know, we're going to do schematic design, design development, construction documents. You can do the, the various scopes of services to get a set of drawings and specifications completed um, to build a building. That description is going to be part of your contract. And there'll be negotiations um, between your company that you're working for and the owner, um, and, and the, the relationships between the parties will be defined in the contract. And that'll be for every project. Now, some contracts may be um, oral, uh, some may be in writing. My recommendation is obviously being a lawyer is, is that everything should be in writing, but sometimes you may have an oral agreement. Um, and then as the project moves further and they bring and the owner brings in the contractor to construct the project, there'll be a separate contract that'll be between the owner and the contractor. But you as the architect will have um, a relationship with how that contract works. So you have to kind of understand overall what a contract is, um, what the purpose, and how they work with you in the design and construction world. Um, kind of think about it, and I'll, I'll say this throughout the semester. It's kind of like when you play a board game. You're going to play Monopoly. It's the rules to playing Monopoly. It's the rules to playing a game of baseball. Everybody has a set of rules, and you have to follow them. And everybody on both sides knows what those rules are. So that's basically a contract. Um, and why you need it is so it's fair. You know, so people understand this is what I'm supposed to do because it's in writing here and said, I'm supposed to do this and you're supposed to do that and we all have a better understanding. So that's what we're going to kind of talk about today. So the first thing here, really basic. What's the theory? A contract is an agreement between two or more parties that's enforceable under law. So you can have you know, most contracts are just two parties, but you can have multiple parties depending on the nature of the relationship. So one thing that may happen to you guys in the construction world is um, your, your, your company as a design firm, let's say you're just working solely for a design firm, may see some business opportunities with a contractor and for a project you may enter into a joint venture agreement between architect and contractor and you become this entity that then enters into a, the agreement with the owner to do design build. So they have this, so you're going to have theirs, three parties that are entered into, and there's an agreement between, again, the owner, the contractor, and the, design, and the designer, and the design build, to perform services, and you have this agreement. The terms and conditions of that contract are what's enforceable under law. So if something goes wrong, Somebody's breached that contract, and then you go to court or arbitration, and a judge or an arbiter will decide legally who was supposed to do what. So the next part here is just the overall kind of general theories. Why do we have contracts? Well, on the very basic level, it just makes sense, you know, so we can all understand what we're supposed to do in this agreement. But kind of as you burrow down a little bit further, and this, this point here is, is is to create predictability, um, to tie down the future. So everybody knows what's going to happen tomorrow, next week, next month, and who's supposed to do what. And if you have an expectation and they have an expectation, then you guys can have this understanding of what's going to happen. And the predictability creates better business. And it's not just simply in construction. It's in any project, in anything, in any type of business. 
And I'll be giving examples throughout today's lecture about different types of contracts and how they apply in different settings that aren't necessarily in the construction world, but mostly we'll talk about how they apply to you guys in, in, the, in the construction industry. And then the third big element here is it's, it's it, to create with it, this bargaining, this trade, this deal that you have, this agreement, you have to have this meeting of the minds. You have to have both parties that understand, I'm supposed to do this, and I understand it, and so do you. And you're supposed to do this, and you understand what you're supposed to do, and so do I. So you want to have this, the meeting of the minds is really important. Um, and if you don't have a meeting of the minds, then there's going to be two things that could go wrong. One, the, the project or the deal or whatever is the, the structure of the contract could fail. Um, the other thing if you have this meeting of the minds, uh, one party may perform and think they're going to be paid or, or get some type of remuneration for the services they perform or the work they do, but if there isn't a meeting of the minds, it may turn out that one party didn't actually deserve that. And so you may not ever, so if you don't have this meeting of the minds, the contract may not actually be a valid legal contract. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Lawyers get caught up in their own crap. They like to hear themselves talk. They like to use big words. They like to use multisyllabic words. Um, they like to put in clauses. You know, I'll, I'll see a paragraph that's one sentence. You don't have to do that. And what I try and what I want to emphasize here is my practice of law, what I try to do. And what I want to try to teach you guys um, is that you, we can break things down into very simple terms. Simple, clear, concise words is what you guys want to think about when you get out into the business world, when after a while you've been working for a while and you, you start to work your way up through the ranks of the company that you're with, to understand if you're going to be sitting down and negotiating a contract, don't get caught up in the, in the, in the, 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 the jargon. Try to say to the other side when you're looking at a clause, what do we really want here? Let's write it that way. So, or when you're working with your lawyer, if you end up having a lawyer and they send you something over and you don't understand what it says, say to them, what are you, what are you trying to say here? Because it doesn't make any sense to me. That's the most important thing that you try to do and, and what I try to impart to my clients. Now, there's going to be times where there's going to be some stuff like when you get into statutory issues or identity where you have to put some legal flower around it. But the most important thing that I wanted to kind of emphasize, and, and, and I'm sorry that the, the audio doesn't work with the clip here, um, is that clarity and simplicity is really important in understanding contracts, drafting contracts, and then interpreting them and using them when you're out there practicing. So, with that, let's move on to the types of contracts. So there's different types um, that you will be using and have used all your life already. You just don't know it. So the three contracts, the types of contracts that I talk about here are out of the box. It's called there's express contracts, there's implied contracts, and there's quasi-contracts. Okay? So what's an express contract? An express contract is the contract that everybody kind of thinks about no matter what. It can be in written, it can be written, or it can be oral. So when you enter into and you write down, I'm going to build a house for you, and I'm going to charge, I'm going to build, I'm, going to, I'm sorry, not build, but I'm going to design this house for you. You have a client, they're a homeowner, and they want you to design a million dollar house. You're going to say, I will design the million dollar house for $100,000. That's my fee, 10% of the value of the construction of the house, and I will do for you schematic design drawings, design development. We will work together during those initial phases to kind of get what you want and your ideas and layouts. And then I'll put together plans and sections and elevations. And then we'll go into a construction document phase. And there'll be all these different things that I'm going to do for you. You're going to give me certain information, Mr. or Mrs. Owner. And then you sign the contract. That's your written contract. It's express. Everybody knows what the terms and conditions are. Everybody has seen it in writing, so it's an express statement and an agreement between the parties of what you're going to do. It can be oral as well. Like I said, I favor and recommend you should have your contracts in writing, but there's nothing wrong with an oral contract. And you can do that very same oral contract with that same owner in orally. You don't have to have it in writing. 
The problem is, with an oral contract, if you're going to be designing this million dollar house, if you don't have the terms in writing in their oral microphone. Um, if you don't have them, if it's not in writing and it's 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 oral, somewhere down the line, the parties may have a different memory of how the conversation went. So that's why you want to try to somehow uh, still it down into written word. So that's an express contract, real basic. Now an applied contract is there's two kinds. There's a quasi, which is implied in fact, I'm sorry, implied in law is a quasi contract, which is the straight implied contract, which is implied in fact. So those are not written or oral. They're not necessarily anything. It's based on an applied contract when it's implied in fact. It's based on the actions of the parties. So I'm sure every one of you guys, maybe I have this example of visiting a vet, when you go into a vet, you bring your pet in, or when you go to the doctor to get a checkup, or you go to the dentist to have your teeth looked at, or you go to a restaurant to order food. Now, you may fill out some insurance forms when you go to those doctors, but certainly when you go to the restaurant, you're not going to fill out a form. But you actually are participating in implied in fact contract. It's implied in fact that when you order the food at the restaurant, and they bring you the food that you will pay. And you have now created a contract. By ordering the food from them, you have agreed if they bring you the food, you will pay. That's an implied contract. It's not in writing. It's not in oral. You never discuss terms with them. You never said, hey, I mean, you have a menu so you can see the prices, but you don't say to the, the, the waiter, you know what? If you bring me this food, will you charge me Fourteen dollars for this entree, uh, entree, and six ninety five for this appetizer, and and three ninety five for the side salad. You don't talk about that. You just say, I want the side salad, the appetizer, and the entree. And when it comes, you get your bill and you look at it and you make sure that you charge correctly and you give them a tip and all these other things. But you've never expressed the terms of the contract, so it's not oral or writing. But you, you don't have an agreement over that part. You just have this implied, in fact, that this is what people do. When you go to the grocery store and you bring things up, it's implied, in fact, that you're going to pay for it. Like I said, when you go to a doctor or a vet, it's implied that if you get services, they're going to pay you for that. Um, when you pay your money to the university here, that you're going to school here, it's an implied, in fact, agreement that they will get you the courses necessary for you to graduate, graduate with a master's in architecture. So that, even right now, we are fulfilling your implied in fact contract with the university. So that's an implied in fact. Now, the quasi contract um, is implied at law. It's a little bit different. It's like a straight implied in fact contract, but it may not necessarily, um, you're, you're, if you had to sue you had to bring some suit against the university because it didn't provide you with sufficient education, you would make an argument that we had this quasi-contract that I paid the university X dollars for my education and I didn't get what I intended to get. I didn't know what that was supposed to be. Another good example of an, a quasi-contract would be um, in the construction world. So you, you hire someone... Um, you're a homeowner, and you have a leaky roof. So you hire a roofer to come in and redo the roof over where there's a leak. And in the process of that contractor repairing the leak and replacing the shingles on your house, that roofing contractor recognizes that there's another part of your, part of your house that's not under that contract where you guys, um, were, were the, where the leak was supposed to be. And they go ahead and repair that other, that other part of the roof. You have been enriched because you have a better roof. Something that was defective has been repaired. But there was no express, either in writing or oral, terms. The roofer was only supposed to work on one part. And it's not necessarily implied in fact because you didn't expect the roofer to go up there and repair the entire roof. You just thought the implied in fact contract portion of it was they were going to repair that portion of the roof where the leak was. 
But because the contractor did something further, you became, in the second term here, unjustly enriched if you don't pay for them. If they performed services, if the one party performed services or provided goods to the other party, and that second party accepts and receives those goods, then we have created a quasi-contract that the party receiving those goods, if they don't pay for them, is unjustly enriched, and the party that's giving those goods or services can bring a claim for quasi-contract, a claim against that. So does that make sense that between the three of them, anybody have questions between an express, implied in fact, and implied in law agreement? Okay. What you're going to see in your profession, and what you're going to see in most of the business world out there, is the express contracts. 80-90% of all that you're going to see is going to come into the express contract world. Interestingly enough, the implied in fact contracts, you guys will be participating in those every day because you go to restaurants or you go to the grocery store or you go to the doctor all the time. But there are going to be very few times when there's going to be a lawsuit based on an implied in fact contract. So of the three, the most you're going to see in operation and that in writing and people for business transactions is expressed, the most that personal people work through, but there's not really much in the world of lawsuits on it, is implied in fact. And this quasi contract comes up on a rare occasion, but it may be because there was this expressed agreement and somebody got something more. Or there may be some relationship where, again, one party benefited from the services or work of the other part of the second party. And so the benefit the beneficiary of those services is unjustly enriched if they don't pay for it. Okay. Next. Each of these types of contracts, express, implied in fact, and quasi contract, could potentially be what's called a bilateral contract or a unilateral contract. Bilateral contract is, is exactly what it sounds like, two or more parties. And it's this mutual exchange of promises for the completion of performance and the promise of a future performance. I promise to design the house for you if you promise to pay me $100,000 for that million dollar design. We have this two party, sometimes three or four party, but for purposes of the discussion, two party agreement. We both have mutual obligations. I will do this and you will do that. And it creates again this predictability. So that's your bilateral contract. A unilateral contract is, as I say here, is something like a contest where there may be two parties, but they don't necessarily sit down and talk about it. They don't enter into terms and conditions. But there is, there is an agreement. So one of, the reasons, one of the ways that I use this as an example, whether you go to the grocery store or whether you go to McDonald's, every year they have the Monopoly, win something Monopoly contest, or when you twist out the cap of a soda bottle and you look underneath that cap, you may have won something. But like, I use the McDonald ones or the grocery store ones because that's, we see it every once in a while. So you, you go in, you get your, your fries, you peel that little thing off, you take a look at it and it says, you want a free french fries with your next meal. That's a unilateral contract. You have never really sat down. You didn't say to McDonald's, all right, we're going to have this deal and I'm going to potentially win. McDonald's has created this contest. Or when you go to the grocery store and you can fill out the Monopoly board and they, that you get the little park place and stuff like that. They've created a contest that you can get free, free giveaways. Or, but, but really it's not free because you have to go to McDonald's and buy something. You have to go to the grocery store and buy something. But they unilaterally have created this contest. And they promise that there's a performance if you do something. Now, here it says no promise of performance by the contestant. You don't have to. If you, if you think about it, there's that, that fast talker guy, you know, 
that after you hear any of these advertisements for these contests, they're like, they talk, 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 talk to them and says, you know, void were prohibited, participation not necessary. And if you look at any of those McDonald's games or any of those the Monopoly games or all these contests, most of the time in the fine print, there's a paragraph that in there that says, you need not purchase to participate in the contest. In fact, they'll have an address, and if you want to write in for the chance to win the million dollars or the new car or whatever, you can fill out a 3 by 5 card, you can mail it to that area, and that has to do with certain state laws. So you don't have to have any performance. I mean, you don't have to, you don't even have to buy food from McDonald's to take place in the Monopoly game. You don't have to necessarily buy food from the Jewel to take place in the Monopoly contest. It's, it's very much in the fine print, but that's why it's unilateral. It's one party saying, here's my contest. If you win, I pay you. That's a unilateral contest, a unilateral contract. So in some ways, it's kind of like um, it's express, but it's not with two parties. Bilateral contract will include express contracts, quasi-contracts, and uh, implied in fact contracts. Because if you're going to a restaurant, you're ordering a meal, that's a bilateral agreement. Okay? Any questions on that? Excellent. Okay. So now we have a contract. So we have this, we have this contract, whether it's expressed, whether it's implied. Is that contract valid? And, or is that contract illegal? Are they void? Are they unenforceable? So this is what you can do to take a look at. So there's a valid contract, and we're going to come up and, and talk about the elements of what's in a valid contract. But that's, that's obviously the gold standard, just get the valid contract. The second thing is, is there's what's called a void contract. And this could be something oral or in writing, but it's actually legally void, not valid. And no matter what the parties agree to, it's always going to be considered illegal or unenforceable. Because from the very beginning, the contract was not valid, was void. Um, now, it could be also against public policy. So an example here is I have a minor. Or it could be that there's a regulation. So the best example to, to understand and explain this is as far as a void contract is if you are under the age of 18, you are not allowed to enter into a contract. So every every boy or girl that's out there cutting people's lawns, shoveling people's snows, raking your lawn, whatever they are to pick up a job, they can't legally have a contract. And so the person at the house could say, well, I'm not going to pay you. And the, the child, the minor, who entered into that oral agreement, I'll cut your lawn for $25, probably can't enforce it because it's a void contract. Minors are not allowed to enter into contracts. Now, there's a whole different thing about whether that's right or not and, and whether the parents get involved and stuff like that. But if from the very beginning is illegal, another void contract would be a contract for uh, between criminals. If you buy any drugs, if you get me these drugs, I'll pay you for them. Well, it's illegal to transfer drugs. So if one party doesn't pay for the drugs or changes the terms of the deal, independent of the fact that you would be stupid to try to go enforce that contract, that contract itself from the very beginning is void. It was never legal. Or if there's a regulation against it. So maybe not it's, a, it's not a criminal offense, but there may be some regulation that's out there. And you enter into a contract, maybe it has to do with the environment. You enter into a contract that says, you know, we're going to do X, Y, and Z, but there's a regulation that says you can't put out that smoke, that, that smoke is contaminating, or this carbon emission is in contamination, and it's in violation of a regulation of either state EPA or the federal EPA. Um, that contract to produce whatever is being produced is, again, is illegal. Sorry, I just had to admit, Jeffrey, I don't know how long he was waiting. How long were you waiting, Jeffrey? Are you there yet? Okay, I'm not sure if he's in yet. Um, so, that's what's called a void contract. Now, a voidable contract 
is a little different. So there's the void and the voidable. With a voidable contract, it seems like it's legal. It looks like it has all the terms and conditions. It's not with a minor. It's not for something illegal. And the parties could perform, but something may have been withheld. So withheld information, or maybe there was some arm twisting, some undue influence that you had to enter into this agreement. So there, so a voidable contract takes the concept of a valid contract, that it seems like on its face it's okay, but the reasons why somebody entered into it, kind of the background story, makes that the contract potentially could be voidable. So like, if I'm going to sell you a piece of property, well, let me give actually a really good example of this. This happened to um, my parents. So they entered, years and years ago, um, my parents, when they retired, they bought a home in northern Michigan. And within the first uh, season, the first winter season that they moved in, there were skylights in the kitchen, and they leaked massively. I mean, there was just, they had to put buckets under any time the snow started to melt, any time it rained. So it was clear that this was something, it, it was so bad, there was no way that these leaks didn't, ju- that they just appeared after my parents closed on the property. So we went back um, and looked at, the, of course, the, the, the disclosure statement that the seller provided to us. And it said that there, it didn't have anything, any discussions about leaks, but it was terrible. So we went through and we went back and said, here's the contract to purchase this house. And we they had already purchased it. And we put together, because we wanted them ultimately to fix it. My parents didn't want to move, but we had to figure out what's the best way to kind of put some, some arm twisting on them on the other side. And so we said, because you withheld information about the leaking, we entered into this with a different understanding. And as a result, we were going to try to void the contract, which would have said, we can move out. You have to take the property back, and you have to return all the money to us that we originally paid for. Now, they ended up, that, that would have been just a nightmare for them, obviously, because they had sold it, and they didn't want to go through all the hassle of that. And my parents didn't want to move, so we ended up coming into a settlement of just paying for the, the fixing of the leaky roof. But that was a contract that was valid. It was between parties. It was express. It was adults. It was legal. But because there was withheld information, it became potentially a voidable contract. Okay? And then the last one is an enforceable contract. An unenforceable contract, again, like a voidable contract, starts with something that's valid. But in this instance, it can't be enforced in a court of law. So a void contract, the second one, is also unenforceable. But in this, just the straight unenforceable contract is not with this illegal one. And in here, there's these examples. Maybe they defrauded you. Um, arguably the contract potentially with my parents um, were they defrauded or was it without information misrepresentation is kind of in the gray zone but um, it could be that there was a safety issue it could be that the, that the parties it was unfair between them um, it could be that there was uh, the, the contract can't be enforced um, due to the timing so there's various reasons legally why a contract can't be enforced um, We'll talk about, there, there's one example here that says statute of limitations and latches is a delay issue. We'll talk about that in a, in a later class. But I'll give you this as an example so you understand um, how a valid legal contract that everybody was on the same page, they all had a meeting of the minds, they were all on the right thing, could not be enforced due to this, what's called a statute of limitations. So in construction, we'll take Illinois as an example, if you want to bring a breach of contract action, you need to bring it within four years of when you knew or should have known of the problem that caused the breach, or if it's a written contract, no longer than 10 years. So let's say that um, you're the you're a school system, the school district, and a contractor builds a new gym for you. And it turns out the roof leaks, but you don't know it's leaking right away because it's not too bad and it takes a little while before the, before the roof starts to deteriorate. But at some point after the project is finished, 
four years later, you find out it's leaking, and you want to bring a lawsuit, a claim, based on a breach of contract because they failed to properly construct the gym, the addition of the gym. Well, if it's outside that statute of limitations, if you don't file the claim within four years of when the leak was discovered, then the contract is unenforceable by law. So a valid contract, the valid be performed, everybody was legal stature and everything else, and there was no fraud, it wasn't unconscionable, all these other items up here. But it actually, just because you brought the claim too late, that's a statute of limitations defense, the contract is now unenforceable. There's nothing to enforce. So that's, so there's different ways that something can be unenforceable. So that's as to the validity. Any questions on validity of contracts? Okay, good. All right. Next, let's talk about what are the elements. Now we're going to go just to valid contracts. So what are the elements? And when you think about um, elements, every in the law, we, we use the term elements. So we're going to talk about contracts, and uh, I don't know if it's next week or week after, we're going to talk a little bit about torts. And the elements are what, what are the, the sections or the portions that make up a valid contract in this one or a valid tort claim. And so for the elements of a valid contract to be a valid and enforceable, there needs to be a proper offer, proper acceptance, mutual consideration, and then the absence of a valid defense. And those valid defenses back on the previous slide could be fraud or statute of limitations, those things that make the contract unenforceable. Okay? So we'll go through each one of these, offer, acceptance, consideration, and the defenses in the upcoming slides. But those are your four elements. And I want you guys to remember these because when we get, as I said, every once in a while I'm going to highlight. So there's going to be something on the test that will talk about elements of a contract somewhere along the line. And you're going to want to see a par there'll be a paragraph in the exam talking about it. And there may be a question that says, which which of the elements is missing, or identify the proper elements, or something like this. So these are so it's important to understand what an offer, acceptance, consideration, and and the, the absence of a valid defense to make sure you have an enforceable contract. So we'll just kind of highlight for you. Okay. So what's an offer? How do we have an offer? So I say to you, you come to me. You're you're a homeowner. I'm a designer, and you come to me and you say. Can you design my house for me? I want, a, I want a million dollar house. Can you design it for me? So that's not an offer. That's a request. You make the offer that says, I'll design that $100,000 house for you for, I'm sorry, that million dollar house for you for $150,000. That's an offer. And the homeowner, the party that's going to hire you, the owner, can say they can reject that. They can accept it. We'll talk about acceptance to that offer. Or they can make a counteroffer. So if I make that offer to you, it says, I'll design that house for you, that million dollar house for you for $150,000. They may, the owner may say, will you do it? I, I'll let you do it for me for 100000 So now they've made a counteroffer. And what ends up happening is the counteroffer is a rejection of the original offer. They basically said, no, I won't accept your 150. Will you do it for 100? That's the counteroffer. And so the 150 is off the table. So that's offer, potentially acceptance, and counteroffer, how that works in that first bullet. Now let's say that there isn't that immediate dialogue. An offer could be open for a reasonable period of time. You get a phone call from that same homeowner and says, uh, will you design this house for me um, and can you put together a proposal? And so you say, yeah, I'll do that. I'll put together a proposal. You get a little bit more information. You understand it's going to be a million dollar house. And so you put together whether you send it by email or you send it by letter, whether you tell them on the phone eventually and say, I'll design that house for you for $150,000. If there's no acceptance or rejection or counteroffer at the time, the offer is still standing. And it will stand for what's called a reasonable period of time. It's sitting out there. So in that instance, 
What's reasonable? Well, if the homeowner calls you back and says within a week or two or three, says, yeah, I'll accept it. I'll go ahead and, and we can do that project for $150,000. We'll pay you that. That seems like the offer is open for a reasonable period of time. But let's say uh, when that first conversation happens, you tell the owner, you know, I'm really, really busy. I'll get your proposal. I'll send it out to you, but uh, I can't promise anything, but it's really busy here. And, and so, so we'll do that house, and, and you send them the offer. We'll design the house for $150,000. And then the owner says, I'll get back to you. And then they go out and shop it around, and they talk to three or four other architects, and they come back two or three months later, and they say, you know what? I'll go ahead. We'll, do, we'll have you design the house for $150,000. Since you, as the designer, have already informed them that you're busy and there's a lot of work going on, you could say, in response to that, even though you think that the homeowner thinks that they're accepting your offer, you could respond and say, no, nope, it's going to be 175 because I'm really busy. You can say, my offer terminated, even though I didn't tell you it had a clock on it, my offer terminated because I told you we were really busy and I needed a response, you took three months, that's too long. So that's an issue where the offer has terminated on its own. Okay? And then the last point here is, um, and this is pretty simple, just it's, it is what it is. The offer terminates as a matter of law upon death or insanity of the parties or destruction of the subject matter. So if, the par if, I, if someone who makes the offer to do the design for $150,000, if that individual passes away and his partner or her partner comes in and starts working on the business, um, that doesn't mean that that offer is still open. In fact, that it's terminated because the individual's passed away. Or if there's mental incapacity, um, again, or, you know, I can design that house for you for $150,000 and it turns out that the land and the property where the project was going to be built has been destroyed or, or some significantly changed. So if the design parameters are different, you could argue that that, that original offer terminated. So that's the concept of an offer and how long it lasts. And you need to have, the offer needs to be then ultimately accepted, which will go next in the next slide, to make the contract valid. So with the acceptance and, and the offer, so when the party making the offer, if they revoke the party, or this is one part, this is called the mailbox rule, we'll talk about that in a second, but you have to have the two together. In order to have this valid contract, the offer needs to be accepted. And it has to be the same terms. The offer and the acceptance must mirror. Any change from the original offer, any modification by the acceptance, has terminated or eliminated that first offer. And the counteroffer becomes the new offer that you need to, the counteroffer needs to be the new offer that has to be accepted by a mirror. So no matter what, and this is the very first part of the contract, is this is the first meeting of the minds. Um, so let me give you an example on that that I'm actually working on with right now. So I, had a, I have a, a, a client um, that's building a, a very high-end um, residence, and it's multi-millions. And when the contractor first came in, um, they provided a pretty detailed bid for the contract. Uh, but it was the contract was not ultimately signed right away, and there were some tweaks. The city came in and did some changes on some stuff where they needed for codes and zoning and everything else, and so they they had to change the price. And so the contractor didn't technically say, "I'm revoking my offer," but the contractor came in and said, "Well, we have to change the price. It's going to go up by another X hundreds of thousands of dollars." So the original terms changed. There hadn't been the mere acceptance. And so until my client, who's the homeowner, accepted the exact offer from the contractor, we didn't have a contract. And we actually just recently, in the last week, finally came to the final terms and conditions on the pricing for the project. And now we're going to sign the contract. So up until that point, there was no mirrored offer and acceptance. Okay. Now, this slide here is going to talk a little bit about the timing um, of the offer and acceptance. And this is where things get a little bit confusing, I guess you say. 
So the party making the offer can revoke the offer at any time prior to acceptance. But that revocation becomes effective when the other party is communicated to the other party. And how does that work? So if you look at this, offers and their revocation are affected, effective when they're received by the second party. So let's go back to the example of uh, this homeowner that comes to you as a designer and you say you're going to design that million dollar house for $150,000. If you put it in the mail or you send it by email, that offer of $150,000, let's use let's just use regular snail mail because it makes a lot more sense because email is so immediate. But let's say you put it the, uh, the proposal in the, in the regular snail mail. That offer is not valid and it's not effective until when you send it as the architect until the homeowner receives it. And the revocation, meaning you pull that 150 and change it to 175, is also not effective until the party receives it. So that's the first step. Acceptances, however, are effective when made even if the offering party didn't receive it. So let's say you snail mail this offer. It's the first of the month and you put it in the mail. $150,000 to design your house. And you mail it to the homeowner and they receive it on the fourth of the month. Okay? You decide on the fifth that we're going to revoke the offer. And you put it in the mail. But on the sixth... The homeowner sends you a letter that says, I accept your $150,000 fee. And that's also sent by snail mail. If the homeowner has not received in hand your revocation, you now have a contract for $150,000. And there's nothing you can do as the person who's going to do the design to get out of it. Even though the homeowner received the offer on the 4th and you mailed your revocation on the 5th, and the homeowner didn't accept till the 6th, if the revocation didn't arrive by the 6th, the receipt or the acceptance of the offer was good on the 5th when it was, or the 6th when it was made. So it's effective when made, but not when received. So they're backwards, or they're, they're, they're opposite, I guess is what you say. And so... That's this question. This whole thing is called the mailbox rule. It's less in, it, this comes up much, much less these days because everybody does things by email and offers and acceptances are, are almost simultaneous um, in the communication. But occasionally you're going to get a proposal in the mail or occasionally you can make the, off, the argument that, well, I sent it to you by email. I didn't open my emails until a few days later. So I never saw your revocation. I accepted it before I received, actually opened up and received your revocation. Um, there may be a question on the test. I've had it in the past, not all of my exams, on kind of this party A sends it part, at this time, party B sends it at that time. So kind of take a look at this as far as, again, offers are when they're received, revocations when they're received, acceptances are when they're made. doesn't matter about whether they're received or not. Okay? All right. Okay, the next element, so we have offer and we have acceptance now, and they have to be near, and, and, and they may be counter offers and otherwise. Now, this, the next part is what's called consideration. You need to have consideration between the parties to be a valuable contract. Consideration is broken down into these three points. Giving or agreeing to give something a value. So, if you've ever heard about, like, there was a movie years and years and years ago called Trading Places with Eddie Murphy and um, I'm trying to remember who the other guy was uh, that was in it. But there was a bet between the parties for a dollar. And so consideration, something of value, it could be as small as a dollar. You could enter into an agreement even though the other side is providing something massive and very worth, worth lots of money. The other side, if they pay you even a dollar, that's considered consideration because it is something of value. I'm going to, and, and it doesn't have to be money. So like, if you're an architect, 
but you're providing are your services. So that's consideration, but the other side also has to provide you consideration, meaning they pay you for something. So we have the giving or agreeing to give something of value, that's necessary consideration. Doing or offering to do something of de detriment. So it doesn't have to be like, I'm going to provide you services. It could be, um, I'm going to do something that may be detrimental to me. I have to give something up that I don't want to give up, but I'm going to do that. And that's a detriment to me, so that, again, it's consideration because it has value. Even if you're giving something up or you're doing something that's not the best for you, that's still considered consideration between contracts. In the last years, I have these examples. So obviously payment of money. Anytime you pay money has value, so that's going to be consideration. As I said, performing of services. Giving up of ownership. I'm going to give up my car. Uh, and so that means there's a contract between the parties that you're going to do something for me, maybe. Maybe you end up, uh, maybe you have a, that, that same kid on the block, uh, that 16-year-old kid on the block. They want a new car. They want to have a car to, to drive around the neighborhood and go to school. And you're the neighborhood, and you say, if you cut my lawn for the summer, I'll give you my car. So you've given up your car. They've given you a service. That's consideration. Um, and then, or agreeing to forego anything that has, has a possibility of being valuable to you. Even if you agree, I won't perform these services or I won't do something. Sometimes you're paid not to do something. Sometimes you're paid not to perform. Sometimes even when you negotiate a contract, like let's say you're going to negotiate an employment agreement. And sometimes in that employment agreement, there's going to be a non-compete clause. So you're, you're an executive or you're a high-level person or maybe you're going to work for a tech company or maybe you're a very, a very well-renowned designer. And you go in and you say, I'm going to work for this company, but for you to get me, I want the extra money because I'm special. So they say, okay, well, we'll enter an employment contract, but when you leave, you are not allowed to work for one of our competitors for 18 months. Well, that's an exchange for whatever dollars they're paying you or whatever position of rank or, or, or uh, authority you're getting in that employment with, with the company you're at now. But you are giving up the possibility of performing with a competitor if you leave them for 18 months. So that's consideration. They're going to give you a good, a good job, and your consideration you're giving back is I'm not going to work for another year, one of your competitors. So if you don't have consideration in a contract, it's not a valid contract. If one party doesn't ever was never going to pay for it, it was always something that they go to get for free, it's not a valid contract and it's not enforceable. So, and this is kind of, of all the elements of contracts, this is kind of the most elusive because sometimes it can be. Oh, is, is me giving up something really detrimental to me such that it's considered consideration. So those are some things that um, you'll need to think about. Any questions on that? Yeah, that could very definitely. Again, because that time could be spent elsewhere. So let's say, for example, um, that you needed to, you want, you want to start working with this company right away, but you can't necessarily, they, they won't let you start for whatever reason, the, the onboarding or what have you. But they say to you, we want to bring you in, but we can't, so you can't start till September and it's June. Well, you really want the job. And they say, we promise to leave that job open if you don't take a job elsewhere and you sit and wait. And so, you're, you're not necessarily giving up something value because you don't have another job. You're not giving up another job. But you're agreeing with them to sit and wait because they're promising to keep that job open. And then you all of a sudden get there. And if you get to September and they say, oh, we don't have a job for you, well, you could argue that we had a valid contract, that there were promises made, and that there was consideration happen, um, and that you should give me a job. So that would be, a, that's a really good example as first time. Another would be like, let's say that you were in a, a conversation with someone, um, and they said, you know, I have this great job for you, but you got to move across the country. I'm, I'm in California, and I need you to be here. You can't do this remotely or whatever. You know, we now know that that's not necessarily as, as much of an issue anymore. But so you, you, you have 
break your lease, you pack up your car, you buy, rent a new apartment, and you move across to L.A., and they say, oh, I'm sorry, I don't have a job for you. Well, you've given up time and choices and everything else, even though you didn't have a job and you weren't necessarily locked into where you were, you still have given up things to move across. That's your consideration. Then you can sue them either for, at, at the very least, the cost of moving and then potentially moving back, but the value of your time, all those other things, because they failed to perform. So, okay. Okay, so we have offer. They have the mirrored acceptance. It's the right timing, and there's been consideration between the parties. So that's your three or your four elements. The last is, it's kind of like a negative element. Um, oh, no, I'm sorry, there's the last, the last couple things here under uh, consideration. Apologies, one more slide. Um, illusory promises are not considered consideration. So um, I'm trying to think of a good idea for something that's illusory. Um, let me ponder that. I'll get back to you because I had I know I had a couple of examples I was thinking of last night, and I should have thrown them in the slides. Um, consideration can go to a third party, so it doesn't have to be between the two parties. And, and like here's a perfect example. I had a lawsuit where um, we represent one of the contractors, but it was for a strip mall that was being built, and there was the contract was between the property owner, the landowner, and the um, my client and a couple other parties to build the strip mall. But the, the entity, the individual who was going to manage and run and make the profit and make the money from the revenue of the rent and otherwise of the strip mall was the landowner's daughter. And so, it, but she was never a signatory on the contract. So there was consideration that we were ultimately, if, if the project wasn't built, she was going to be losing revenue. And so there was consideration because of the third party, and that's where she was giving up revenue. So that created this third party beneficiary. She was the beneficiary of the deal between the contractor, my client, and the property owner, because it was his daughter. Um, a substitution for consideration, the detrimental reliance or promise of promissory estoppel, that's that you move across the country. I relied on your detriment or the timing issue. Um, I, I gave up time based on a promise you made to me. So that's the detrimental reliance. Um, I'm trying to think of illusory. Oh, so an illusory contract, here's a good example that says, um, where it's that same, it's that same uh, uh, terrible neighbor that goes to the neighbor boy and says, you know, he wants a car. And, and I say to you, if you cut my lawn and you do a really good job, then I'll give you the car. Well, really good job is not necessarily defined. So I may not have to perform as the homeowner, as the guy. He, at the end of the summer, you might say, your, your, your services were terrible. And remember, that was the deal. The deal was, uh, if you do a really good job, I'll give you the car. So there was no consideration there because I never gave anything up. That's the illusory promise. And so that's something that makes the contract not valid and not enforceable um, when, when you put a, a qualifier in there. I may do this for you if you do that. If the other side does what they're supposed to do. That's their consideration. But because I say I may or I could or if you meet a standard but it's a, not a clear standard, those are all illusory promises. So if you don't have one of those, then you don't have a valid contract. Okay, next slide. This is the defenses I want to talk about. So now you have a contract where you have all three, the first three, offer, acceptance, and consideration. But how does the party get out of that? How does the party get out of performing? Well, there could be a mutual mistake of fact. It could be a unilateral mistake. There could be fraud between the parties. It's illegal, which we talked a little bit about that before. Or lack of capacity. So what's a mutual mistake? Mutual mistakes are when both parties come to an agreement, but they both are mistaken as to the facts of the agreement. And as a result, there's no contract. So here's the situation in, in construction. That homeowner comes to you and says, I bought this new piece of property and I want to build a million dollar house on it. And you say to them, 
Oh, I know that area. There used to be a warehouse there. There used to be some railroad tracks. It's kind of a new developing neighborhood. Um, I see some really cool stuff going down there. Do you know, is it zoned for commercial, residential, industrial? And the homeowner says, oh yeah, it's a residential. You can go ahead and design. So now I, the architect, believe that the property has um, a residential zoning. And you, as the homeowner, believe that the property has residential zoning. But if it turns out, and I say to you, I'll design that house for you for $150,000, and then I start to do the work, and I get in there, and I find out that it's industrial zoning, and that I'm going to have to change my design, or it's some hybrid. And as a result of the mistake of fact that both parties had, you could say, well, you know what, I'm not going to do this for 150. And even if the other side, the homeowner comes back and sues you for the $150,000, you say, but there was a mutual mistake of fact. Both parties here mistakenly thought that the area was zoned residential. And as a result, the terms on which the contract was, was based, we didn't have a meeting of the minds. Even though we both thought the same thing, I mean, it was near, we both said residential, there wasn't really an understanding of the true facts, so there wasn't really a, if this mutual mistake makes the contract a defense to it. So one party can say, I'm not going to perform because that contract is not enforceable. So that's a mutual mistake effect. So there's a little difference, but in either instance, the architect should be able to get out of the contract or should be able to say, I can't be held to my original price. And the reason why and is there's a couple things. And if you remember when we talked about in the hierarchy, the very, very bottom, there was like the very last of the bullets in the hierarchy there was industry standard or practice. And so if you enter into this oral agreement between owner and, co and designer, and they want a million dollars, and the owner says to you it's residential, and that's all you have, and you say, I'm going to do it $150,000. Industry standard generally says that the architect is not responsible for determining the facts and information about the ground or where the property is going to be built when they enter into that agreement. Now, a good architect might start to do that because they're probably, may they be charged with getting permitting and stuff, but normally, when you look at it, we'll get to that in a couple of weeks when we go through the B101, the, the, the AAA contract that's the owner-architect agreement. It specifically has a section called owner obligations. And in that owner obligation, it talks about land surveys, legal descriptions, um, permitting our owner obligations. And that's pretty standard in the industry. So if the homeowner comes back to you from that first example that you gave, it's a but you're a licensed architect, you should know this. The industry practice and most of the form contracts say, even if I should know this, that's an owner, typically an owner obligation to provide you that information. And as a result, because the industry kind of treats it that way, I'm allowed to rely on your mistake it turns out that we're mutually mistake. We have a mutual mistake here, and I'm allowed to rely on that when I quoted the price. The second and the nuance a little bit further in is when I go in, or maybe it's, I don't know if it's different or just a, a continuation of when I go in and I start to do my own due diligence because I'm a good licensed professional, and I do want to find out about that. In fact, we even had that conversation. Oh, I know the area, blah, blah, blah. And I do my double check and I find out that it is zoned industrial. You can use that as, again, that we had this original mutual mistake, but I found out, and as a result, I'm going to charge you more, and the owner will not be able or should not be able to demand that you do it for the 150 because if you have to put in more time and services based on this, again, mutual mistake, whether it was on, on a reliance or, or just the conversation, again, you should be able to, and at a minimum, modify the contract, but if you want to walk away from the contract, you could because this is a defense, a mutual mistake. So, That's exactly right. Yep. Correct. And and what will happen is, is the new architect uh, will have to be told that it's how it's zoned. Um, or again, um, so then the, the so it, it's it's trying to.
it, it's this little nuance between this original concept of a meeting of the minds because there was a meeting of the minds. You told me industrial or residential. I heard you residential. I quoted you residential. So there was a meeting of the minds, but it turned out both parties were mistaken on that basic fact of what the contract was was part of. So, so that's why it's a defense to the enforcement of that contract. Okay. Now, a, a unilateral mistake is typically not a defense. So in that instance, let's say that the architect actually knew that it was industrial. And the owner said, uh, well, no, it's residential. But if the architect knew, uh, the homeowner's mistaken, the architect knew it was industrial just because they designed in the area or, or somewhere else like that, and enters into the agreement, if the, the architect comes back and says, oh, wait, nope, it is, res it is industrial, and didn't correct the homeowner, that's a unilateral mistake, meaning the homeowner was mistaken, and the bid is, is based on this residential zoning, but the architect knew. So one party knew. That's called a unilateral mistake, and that tr traditionally is not a defense. Now, occasionally there can be a unilateral mistake as a defense. It's very rare, um, and you don't need to worry about it for purposes of the class, but it's, sometimes there's a defense that comes up um, that only one party is mistaken, and it's more when you have a unilateral contract, um, less when it's an agreement. So, um, as I said, it, it's an occasional, but most of the time a unilateral mistake when only one party has not all the facts. Um, and it's not like the one party's withholding the information from the other side. Maybe in this example of zoning, maybe a little bit more um, straightforward. The architect should have said something. But, but there, there could be some times when there was just only one party that had a mistake the other one didn't nefariously withhold that information, but they can't use that as a, as a reason to get out of the contract. Um, so the other ones here are fraud. Obviously, if one party defrauds the other, lies to them, uh, and puts the contract together based on lies and, and baseless uh, facts, the other side that, that is being forced to perform um, can get out because they say, look, you, you defrauded me in the beginning. There's no contract. Um, the legal contract, minor, uh, for illegal goods or services, things like that, if the contract was always illegal uh, based on uh, statute, criminal, or, or civil. Uh, again, those are count that's a defense to even if you had offer, acceptance, consideration, near, meeting the minds, everything else. If it's illegal, you can't have that. And then the last here is, is um, or the last on this slide, there's one more slide, is lack of capacity. You know, someone that is, uh, is mentally incapacitated, uh, that's a defense to a contract. And you, and you hear about things like that when, when, um, Somebody who's senior, their, their parents or, or someone else that enters into an agreement with somebody and then the estate comes in and tries to get them out of that contract and says, look, they didn't have the capacity to enter into that agreement, so you can't enforce that. So that's lack of capacity. A um, couple other ones. Duress or coercion. So if one party forced you to enter into an agreement, whether it's um, threatening to, to harm your business if you don't enter an agreement with them or, or whatever it might be. Any of those types of, of uneven handedness between one party or the other, um, that's a defense to a contract, even though on paper it looks fine. Uh, statute of limitations, as I said, we talk about here a little bit more. So uh, if, if in one of the facts, if you try to enforce a contract and it's outside any of these terms here, which I'll talk about in a second, that contract's not enforceable. So, for purposes of general law, if it's a written contract, any written contract, whether it's construction, outside of the construction world, the written contract is valid for 10 years. If you try to enforce terms from a contract that's more than 10 years old, it's unenforceable. If it's oral or one of these implied in fact or quasi contracts, if you try to enforce it five years after the contract was entered into, it's unenforceable. So that's general contracts. In Illinois and many other states, they've created special statutes shortening those times. So in Illinois, it's four years from the discovery of the problem, when you knew or should have known. So when that roof starts to leak and you see the water dripping, it doesn't matter about the contract, whether it's oral, written, or anything else. You need to make a claim within four years of when you saw the, the, the roof dripping. It's not four years from when the roof was finished. 
It's four years from when you knew the problem started coming, and then you have four years from that. But it's not an open-ended. So they have that's called that's called a statute of limitations of the four years. And it's not open-ended. It's called a statute of repose, meaning you only have ten years from the completion of the project to find a problem. So that ties back with a 10-year written contract. But So let's say, for example, you have this contractor builds the gym extension for your high school. And everything seems fine. You don't see any leaks. And then it's nine years later, nine years after the building is, the, the gym is opened, and it starts to leak. Because of the statute of repose, the second of those two bullets, you are in the state of Illinois within the time frame that you could still bring a claim. And then when you figure that out on year nine, the third day of year nine, you have another four years after that to file that lawsuit or file an arbitration, whatever it might be. So in Illinois, with the 10 and 4, it potentially could be 14 years after the project is completed before you as the contractor or the architect could get sued. So that's um, much longer than the 10 years that's up above. On the flip side, if you see that roof leaking in year one and it's a written contract, you have to bring that claim within four years because once you discover it, then the four years kicks in. So in that instance, that four years means the claim would have brought within five years after the building was completed, and that's shorter than the 10-year written statute of limitations. So sometimes in Illinois, the way this repose and statutes work out, sometimes you may have to bring the claim shorter than the general law, and sometimes it could be longer than the general law. It depends on when you discover your problems. So those are the... So, so, the bottom two, the four and ten years, are the ones that you guys want to pay attention to with respect to your profession. And if there's any questions in the project, in the contract, or the on the exam on statute of limitations, which then there probably will be, you may have to do some math. And maybe a, a lot of my a lot of my test questions, just as you know, are kind of like paragraphs, kind of a fact scenario. And all of my questions are either multiple choice or true false. Um, so you may have to do some figuring out of what happened when to see if a claim was within a statute of limitations or otherwise. Any questions on statute of limitations and statute of repose for this as far as a defense to a legal contract? Okay. And then the last one is unconscionability. So that's kind of like duress or coercion, but, but when there's one party so much in favor, so much bargaining power over the other, that you kind of have to enter into it. Um, it's so contrary to good conscience. I will say this, on a practical basis, this is a very difficult one to prevail on. The courts will traditionally say, um, you're all grown people, you're all entering into these business contracts, um, and you all could have hired a lawyer. So even though it's this big behemoth company that um, has the business locked up, and you really want to work with them, and their terms are terrible, but they have kind of the monopoly in the, in the area, we're still going to enforce the contract. You know, you're some small-time uh, app designer, and you want to go and get, you, you want to sell, and you have this small little business, and you want to sell it to Apple. And Apple is this massive, huge, you know, worldwide conglomerate, the, the, the richest company in the world. Um, the, the disparity between you and them, and they're going to, if you don't enter into a deal with them, they're going to put you out of business because of what's going on. You would think that's not really in good conscience and the terms are very one-sided in favor of them and not in you. Of course, they probably are going to enforce that agreement because they're going to say, well, you could have taken your chances and tried to, to go it alone and, and you, you entered into this agreement. So unconscionability doesn't normally work in business sense. Sometimes in people, individuals, the big bully and the, you know, the David and Goliath for individuals, but most of the time in the business world, unconscionability is, is a difficult defense to get out of a contract. Okay. Any questions on those, on defenses? All right. The last thing on contracts as far as how they work and everything, and, and this part is um, uh, assignment. 
So the assignment of the contracts um, a delegation. So you can enter into an agreement and then ultimately assign it to somebody else to perform the services. So an assignment is giving a contract right or duty to another party and then you are completely removed from the transaction. So let's say, um, again, the, the homeowner comes to you and says, design my million dollar house. You enter into the contract to do it for $150,000. And then due to personal circumstances or otherwise, you can't finish the work. So long as the contract allows it, you can assign it to another contractor or to another designer. And all of the terms and conditions, the 150000 how you're going to do the designs, all of the things that were the meeting of the minds, transfer to the new party. And once the assignment's finished, as long as permission was allowed and everything else, you're out of it. So you have no more obligations. Once it's assigned, it's off your desk, it's off your plate, and you have nothing to do with it if it's a pure straight assignment. And the other party picks up all of your duties and obligations. A similar, a similar, but a little bit different, is what's called delegation. So in delegation, same scenario, you have a different architect doing the design, but you are still involved in the transaction. Meaning, you have responsibilities. If you've delegated to someone and they fail to perform, you could still be held liable because you've delegated these duties. So that's the difference. Assignment, once it's assigned, you're out of it. Delegation, you're still responsible for it. Okay, last question. What can be assigned or delegated? So personal duties usually cannot be assigned and delegated. Now, I gave you the example of, of potentially you assigning the contract to perform the design services to another designer. And the other side could object by saying, yeah, but I hired you because of your design skills. So as a result, you can't assign it to someone else. You can't delegate it. That may be different in construction side. You know, there's only so many ways to put up a two by four, or only so many ways to put in an HVAC ductwork system. So goods and services potentially can be assigned, or goods can be assigned, and some types of work can be assigned, but maybe something creative, you know, or you can't, um, have a contract where I'm, I tried out to be in a play and I'm, I'm a Broadway actor. And I can't, I can't take that contract and assign it to my brother who's a pretty good singer because I was the one that has the personal duties. So you can't assign or delegate those to them. But as I said, generic duties, hammer, nail, those types can be assigned and delegated. So you have this valid contract, offer acceptance, consideration, there's no defenses, but you want to bring in a different party as one of the two that are performing or one of the parties that are performing, you can bring someone else in by either assignment or delegation. Any questions? All right. Next. So we have this contract. We want to figure out how to interpret. Like, how do you read that? When, when you go to court, when you go to arbitration, well, what happens when you have all these legalese? And this, this part of the... the uh, lectures why you want to have as clear and as simple as terms as possible because there's all these different ways I read the contract one way you read it the other how do we interpret so there's some rules there's some basic um, steps as far as how to interpret the contract so the first coming out of that is the trier of fact when you go to court when you go to an arbitration there's what's called a trier of fact and the trier of law the trier of law is always going to be the judge or the arbiter the trier of fact is going to be a jury if you have a jury trier. But if it's a bench trial, which is the judge only, they also will be the trier of fact. And the trier of fact is the person who takes the facts and tries to sort out what they need. What are really the facts? What does this language really mean? There may be legal ways to how you look at that language, but they're trying to factually assess what was the meeting of the minds between the parties. What was the agreement what were the duties of obligations? What factually can I assess from that? And the court or the arbiter, the entity that's reviewing that, they don't rewrite the contract. So if it says you're supposed to do A, B, and C, the judge or the jury as the trier of fact is not supposed to see, well, they were supposed to do A, B, and C, but I think C really means D. 
you're not supposed to rewrite and make CD. What you're trying to do is say, C means C, but what is really the terms of C? So you can't rewrite the contract when you're the trier fact or the trier of law. Okay. So the first level, once you know where that's what your job is, is the trier fact, then you can't rewrite. How do you do this? The first level is you want to look at the clear and unambiguous language. And then the court for the arbitration enforces it as written. Hey, it says, if they design this house for you, you're going to pay them $150,000. That's what it says. So you owe them $150,000. And if it's clear in the contract, if the written words are clear, the parties can't come in and try to argue why it means something different. They can't explain or clarify. They can't bring in external information. Well, this is what we really meant. I know it says that we were supposed to be paid 150 for this work, but really it's 175 because all these other things that we talked about on the side. Well, if it's not in the contract, the court's not going to enforce that. And why do we do this? It's because... The contract, if you remember from the very beginning, was to instill predictability and the meeting of the minds and what's the deal. And so the only way to resolve conflicts between the parties as to who owes whom what, who's supposed to do what kind of work, is to enforce the terms as written without extraneous information. And that's the first level. And if you can do that, you don't need to go any further. You look at it, you read it, you enforce it. That's what the court, the judge, the jury, the arbitration is supposed to do. Any questions on that first level of, of how you interpret the contract and how you come to a decision of what the meeting of the minds were? So that, that's a great question. And in fact, it happens at all different levels in the construction world, at all different levels at all different times. So there's this, um, for those of you guys who have worked a little bit, there's this uh, thing that you'll be very familiar with the rest of your career called an RFI. It's a request for information. So you have this contract with the owner that you're going to design the drawings. And the drawings are actually part of the contract. The, the, the actual contract will say the contract documents, which means it's part of the contract, the four corners of the contract, will include our drawings and specifications. And the reason why you want that is because you want the contractor to build exactly as you drew it. But as we will know, and as you'll learn, there's no such thing as a 100% perfect set of drawings, and there's no such thing as a project where every single corner, bolt, and nail has been drawn. There's certain things that everybody understands when they review a drawing, that they understand if there's a wall here, it's supposed to be 16 inches, studs on 16 inches, and all these other things. So, um, but what may end up happening is that the contractor looks at the drawings, it isn't as clear, so they issue an RFI. So that creates a request for information to clarify whether the contract, which includes your drawings, what do they really say? And at that instance, you, as the architect, will answer that RFI, and hopefully it doesn't go any further. It doesn't require a change order. It doesn't require more pricing to the project. But at that point in time, you guys are actually doing this first level of analysis. You're looking at the objective language, meaning which includes, for your profession, the actual drawings and specifications. And so sometimes you may respond to the RFI and say, see page A15, detail 2, and it'll have a section of how that wall detail is supposed to be built, and that's your answer. The RFI says, look to this clear language as to what my drawing is of how this wall detail is to be built. Or, you may have to provide more information because, again, your drawings aren't 100% perfect, but that's this enforcement of the language as written. If it, if it distills and goes higher up, sometimes it may be actually the language of the written contract, not the drawings, but the actual written contract. And then maybe um, you have an independent decision maker or you have uh, outside mediator, arbitrator, that again starts to do this first level analysis. And if it goes even further, sometimes it goes all the way to a judge or jury. So this first level this of what the contract says, including your drawings and specifications, 
happen throughout the course of the construction project. Does that answer your question? Okay. Good. Okay. So, but what happens if we can't get that? We can't get the answer. The writing is crappy because it was a crappy lawyer, or the the the, the drawings aren't as clear, and the architect says, see page A15, detail two, and it's not clear. What do you do from there? Well, how do you how do you get that? That's the second level. And the second level, and this is more this is more of an esoteric and this concept of what's called parole evidence. This will not be on the exam, but I just wanted to bring it up because there are two levels of analysis on interpreting contracts. So I feel I can't just say there's only one level, so I wanted to tell you. But I'm not going to ask you any questions on parole evidence because it's kind of, it's very hard to interpret. It's, it's a, it, to your second year of law school, you start trying to figure it out, and then after you practice for about 10 and you finally see it, you understand it. Parole evidence is actually using these outside explanations and facts and communications to help explain what the parties agree to. So it seems kind of counterintuitive. Here you have a contract, you have a meeting of the minds, you have everything written down, you have these clear drawings and specifications. It should be enough. Why do we have to bring in this outside extra stuff? Well, um, sometimes you do. So, and sometimes you don't. It says here, it's never permitted if they're clear and unambiguous contract terms. So if it says, I'll design it for you for $150,000, you can't bring in extra radius evidence. It says, no, it was really one hundred seventy-five, dollars and here's all the reasons why. It is what it's written. If that detail on page A15 of your designs is clear as to why that wall was supposed to be written that way, um, that's the cost. That's what it's going to be. And if you have um, uh, the drawings are fine or whatever, you're not going to be able to bring pro evidence. You can, however, bring in parole evidence if the contract is silent um, or if it's unclear and ambiguous. So sometimes there's reasons to bring it in because if that detail on page A15 didn't have all the information of how that wall was supposed to be put together, you could argue that contract was silent and so there needs to be some information. Or if that clause about when payment was supposed to happen. Maybe it's an agreement that the 150000 was to be paid, but it's silent on when payment was supposed to be rendered. 60 days, 30 days, on a regular monthly basis. Then you can bring in parole evidence to kind of show what the parties agree to. Um, so that's where these things clear. When, when it's not clear, when it's, it is ambiguous, that's when you bring in this kind of extraneous information. So... And so you don't have to worry about this for the exam, but I think it, it, it does filter in from time to time in the course of, of, of practicing, especially in construction, because you guys will learn very quickly, nothing's perfect, nothing's ever complete. There's no such thing as a project without, it, without any change orders. Um, it just, that, that's just the nature of it, because you just, if you had to detail and draw every single thing for every project, uh, it, it would take you forever. And the, the set of drawings and specifications would be massive. You just can't do it all. So, Okay. Um, a little bit more back, we were talking about express and implied. So express terms of the contract, are sp the distance part of interpretation. Is it an express term? It's going to be spelled out. Express terms are going to be clear. They're, they're put out there. Implied terms, however, are part of the agreement, but they're not necessarily written down. And this gets into this industry practice. So back to, Chase, to your question about with the zoning, contracts, the AIA contracts and good form contracts will say, the owner's obligated to do this, this, and this, and this, and this. And those are going to be express terms in the contract, a well-written contract. But if the industry practice is the owner's going to do A, B, and C, but it's not written, it's still going to be implied because everybody understands that's the party's obligations. You know, the, you always know that the architect is going to be doing the drawings. It's not going to be the contractor doing the drawings. It doesn't have to say contractor won't draw and architect will draw. It's implied because that's just the nature of the business. So um, there's a couple things that, there's a number of things that uh, are commonly implied in construction contracts. But um, here, here's some that no matter what, you're going to see these, whether you see them in writing or not, this is, these are just three examples. There's probably, you know, 50 I could put, but I just so you guys can understand. Uh, but if it doesn't say it in the contract, it still implies that neither party will hinder the other from performing. 
The owner will not stop the architect from doing its design. The architect will not stop the owner from providing information. The architect, the owner won't hinder the contractor from doing its work. They won't be directing traffic. So those are implied. And or the owner will not pay late. If they pay late, well, that's hindering the contractor or the architect from performing because they're not getting paid. So that you can't do that, even if it doesn't say it in the agreement. Um, Construction will be performed in a good and workmanlike manner. That's implied. You know, you don't want to have crappy construction. You don't have to say that. Most contracts will have a language that says contractor will perform in a good and workmanlike manner, but if it's silent, it doesn't matter. It's implied in every construction contract. Um, and then the other one, the architect will perform, perform his or her duties in accordance with the appropriate standard of care. So the standard of care is kind of like your, and we'll talk about this lots throughout the semester, that's kind of your benchmark. You guys, your baseline. You have to perform at least to the standard of care of what an architect would do in your area for that type of project. Um, contractors have to provide a warranty. Architects do not. Architects just have to perform to the standard of care. So anytime you enter into an agreement, whether it says that or not, the architect, it is implied that they will perform in accordance with the standard of care. So those are, in every, every construction scenario, those are examples there. Any question on express and implied terms in an agreement when you're interpreting? Okay. Next. What do you do if there's an inconsistency? What happens if one paragraph of the contract says something, says A, and then in the specifications, the contract says something different? It's the same issue. What happens if there's a drawing on page A1 and when you flip to page A2, it's inconsistent or contradictory. So the drawings don't match. What do you do to resolve those? So, here's some rules of how to interpret when there's inconsistencies. First, are the words contradictory? Sometimes when you look at it, or are they inconsistent? When you look at it, they, on first blush, they may seem inconsistent, but when you then look at it in context of how they apply in the project or the, the scenario, they aren't inconsistent. So you have to look to see and you have to take paragraph one and paragraph three and compare them in the overall scheme of the project to see if they are inconsistent or contradictory. That's the first level. If they are, then you have to see is there a, con a contractual rule or a judicial rule that shows how to read them together. So there are certain rules on contractual and judicial. So you, you find out, yeah, we have these two clauses that are inconsistent. Now the first level after that, we, we know that they're contradictory or inconsistent. Now we're going to look to see, is there a rule in the contract itself that says how to resolve those inconsistencies? So we read through it, and there, there probably is going to be a good contract. We'll have a procedural clause. It'll have a clause that says, if this happens, this is what you're supposed to do. Or priority. This is more important than this, than this, than this. Okay? So it may say one document supersedes another. So the specifications supersede the drawings. So let's say on your drawings it shows um, that you're supposed to have, uh, when you're doing a brick masonry wall, supposed to have weep holes, which is at the very bottom of the brick masonry wall, if you guys aren't familiar with that. Very bottom of the, and actually at certain levels. As they're laying down, they put down the, the mortar, and then they put the first layer of bricks, and they do another layer of mortar. In some of those joints, they're going to take this little piece of cloth that looks like a cloth rope, and they're going to lay it in there, and then they're going to put a brick on top of that. That's all ultimately called a weep hole. And what ends up happening, because bricks are porous, and if the water gets into that, and it starts pooling down as it goes down to gravity, it needs to get out of that wall system, and obviously the, it's not going to come out of the mortar because the mortar joint's very, very um, supposed to be not porous, but the brick is porous. So when it comes to that piece of cotton, that cotton rope, that cotton rope soaks up that moisture, absorbs it, and it's sticking outside of the wall. Just, and if you look around, if you ever walk around your house and look at the bottom of the bricks, you're going to see these little pieces of cotton hanging out at every so many inches. That's a little thing. So that can void, that moisture can evaporate out so your walls stay dry. Well, let's say that the drawings show the weep holes are every 12 inches and the specifications say the weep holes are every 18 inches. Well, you may have a provision in the contract that says specifications supersede the drawings 
And so therefore, the mason puts them out at every 18 inches because specs are more important than drawings. Another clarification that may be a rule in the contract that says lengthier or more expensive procedure. So it may say, as you're looking through it in the specification, there may be a very simple way to do it, and then another paragraph has a very detailed way to do it. Well, that may be more expensive than the simple way, but the rule in the contract may say lengthier or more expensive procedures is priority. Um, or another rule in the contract may say if you see an inconsistency, who is supposed to resolve that? If it's a aesthetic issue, it's the architect. And it's going to say, if there's issues with the aesthetic, the architect has priority over all those. If there's issues with constructability of how the joints come together, the contractor may have the priority of how that works, and the architect doesn't get involved. So there may be a rule as to who is responsible. So it doesn't, it's not solved by a superseding draw, uh, a document. It's not solved by expensive or lengthier, but it could be solved because I'm the contractor and that's my space that I'm supposed to figure it out, or I'm the architect and that's my job to figure it out. So those are contractual rules to resolve that inconsistency. Any questions on that? And there's more. There could be more. This is just examples. It's what's written in the contract of what those rules are. Okay? All right, next one is there are judicial rules. So these are legal rules. And whether they're written in the contract or not, if you have to take it to court or you have to take it to an arbitration, they're going to apply these. They're first going to look at the rules of the contract, but then they're going to go and they're going to say, this is what the law says. So here's three examples, and there's other ones, but here are three examples of the judicial rules of contract construction. Specific, you follow before general. So again, the more detailed over the more expansive. So you follow the specific. And the courts, if it's between paragraph A and B, they will enforce the more specific provision. Another judicial rule is construe the contractual language against the party who drafted the contract. So if I draft a contract and I give it to you and you sign it without any edits, you read it, but you sign it, and it comes out that there's a challenge to the validity of issues in the contract, the court's going to look against me because I drafted it. And if I drafted it poorly, or if I drafted it and it's not valid, or if there's other issues with it, the court, by judicial construction, is going to look against me. They're going to construe it more astringently against me and with more favor to the other party judicially. They're going to defer because I put, hey, I wrote it. I should be able to the one that has to follow it. And then the last judicial rule is to construe the contract. Last one is an example here. So you guys need to know. Is to construe the contract as a whole. So maybe paragraph one and three are inconsistent. But when you read the whole contract with all the other paragraphs together, can we merge them and mesh them so they actually work while inconsistent, they work as a complete whole. So the courts will step back and say, although the dispute before us is simply paragraphs one and three, and what were the parties intending to do that? What we're going to do is we're going to read the whole contract and see the intent of the whole project and the whole deal between the parties. And we'll do our best to interpret paragraph one and three in light of that whole party, of that whole deal. Does that make sense? All right. A couple more slides and we're done. So, what happens when you need to modify a contract? Let's go back to our example of the, um, the zoning issue. So the parties <coughs> have this mutual mistake of fact that, you know, the homeowner's like, God, I really love this site. It's got this beautiful view. Uh, we'll do what we need to do. Let's figure this out. I know it's going to cost me more money, um, and I know i got to go out and get the place rezoned. I'm gonna, I'll hire somebody to do that, and I've got another contract with them. But Let's figure this out. Well, you have a contract that's written that says, I'll design it for $150,000. So I'll design your million-dollar home. You have to modify that contract. You have to ch do a change order. You have to amend it. So there are certain processes that you have to go through. And that's the very simple one. 
let's look at just regular construction where um, the contractor's looking at that wall detail and they send out this RFI and it turns out that the contractor, as they understood the agreement and they understood the drawings, did a certain price based on the way this wall was designed. And if it turns out that the wall can't be built that way or needs to be changed or otherwise, you still have to modify the contract. And so, as a result, you need to be able to have this process, and it's called change orders, and we'll get into them a little bit more, but, I want, but on a very high level, and so those are examples in the construction world, but on a very high level, what you need to understand is every single contract can be modified so long as the parties agree to modify the agreement. And even if the contract says, this contract may not be modified, as long as the parties agree, you can modify it. And even if the contract says, this contract may only be modified by terms in writing, if the parties orally agree, you can modify it. So this is the part where you're like, why do lawyers put in provisions that say this contract can't be modified? Or why do they put in provisions that say this contract can only be modified by written agreement of the parties? When I'm telling you as a lawyer, and there is case law in every state in the union that says you can orally modify a written contract that says you can't orally modify a written contract. Why, why, do, why do we do that? Well, the reason why as lawyers we do that is because we want to try to encourage you, as I've said probably half a dozen times on this call today, you can have an oral contract, but I, as your lawyer, recommend you to have it in writing. So I'll put the clause in that says, this contract may not be written, may not be modified except for in writing, to make sure that the parties follow the rules of monopoly. They play the game the right way to protect themselves, to ensure predictability. So the clause itself ultimately has no legal validity to say this contract may not be written, may not be modified orally. It has no legal validity, but it's written as a rule. So you're playing Monopoly correctly. So you are creating predictability, and so you don't, so you continue to have a record of the meeting of the minds. So the takeaway in the slide is you can always modify even if it tells you you can't modify, and writing can be done, it can be done by orally or written, either way. The, the key, though, is the timing of the modification. When is it done and why is it done? So what you can't do is if someone performs work, and unless there's an agreement, try to modify it later. Now, you can later after the fact if everybody agrees, but you want to make sure if there's going to be work performed and you're going to modify that contract, you do it before the work's performed so everybody's on the same page. If not, you'll have to try to get everybody to agree. I had a piece of negotiation yesterday where we were working with a contractor that's going to be building some stuff um, for us down south. And there's a provision in there that says the owner may unilaterally and in sole discretion change the scope of the project by oral or written request so long as they follow paragraph 8.2 of the agreement. The contractor came back and said, you can't unilaterally change a contract on your own whenever you want by oral, we have to do this in writing. And they were like all up in arms because they didn't want to have people out in the field demanding them to change this and that for hundreds of thousands of dollars or whatever they want, whenever they want. That completely screws them up. And I wrote back to the guy, the contractor, the contractor and I said, as the owner, we can always change what we want as a scope of work. So I'm not going to agree to your request to say we can't unilaterally change. But see this sentence that says, see paragraph 8.2, that one has language in there that gives you the option, if we change the contract, you can charge us for it. So go look at read, go look read, I had to kind of point them in the right direction. So go read paragraph 8.2. 
But we can modify the contract if we want. So let's have an agreement that we can modify it if we want. And then your other, the other beef was, it has to be in writing. Well, if you look at paragraph 8.2, it says, any oral modification must be put in writing as soon as practically possible. Because sometimes you're in the field, and you're walking the project site, and there's an emergency because they're pouring concrete, and you need to make sure if the rebar's set properly, or something like that, and you have to make a modification right there. And you have to change it. Say, no, you have to do it this way. It's do it being done wrong. Well, there's a modification to maybe what's in the drawings. It has to be done orally. Maybe it costs more money, but as long as you write it up later. So there's all different ways of, but the timing there is key. And the contractor was trying to say, I won't do any work, additional work, unless I know I'm getting paid and unless I know it's in writing. And I'm like, I agree with that. But sometimes there are circumstances in projects where you have to do it right away. So timing is important, but any contract can be modified by any party, as long as there's an agreement. Right? Now, reformation is another way of changing the contract, only it's actually um, not technically modification. Modification, when you modify a contract, um, it's a change order, it's adding pricing, at least in the construction world, it's tweaking and... and, and, and because something expanded, or there was a delay, so I get more money for the time for my time of the delay, or, or other things. That's a, that's a modification or change order. The reformation of the contract is when this example of the um, of the billion dollar house for one hundred fifty thousand dollars, but it was the wrong zoning from the very beginning. The actual agreement between the parties was really to be designing a house in an industrial zone that needed to be converted. And so that base contract for $150,000 is going to be reformed because it's a central term to the deal and you're going to reform the contract to accurately reflect the actual agreement between the parties. Now, it could require a lawsuit for reformation. So because one party, if one party refuses to perform on the other, you're going to say, well, I'm going to reform it. So let's say that the contract, the owner in our situation says, I'm not going to pay you $175,000. And you've done the work. Well, you may need to file a suit after the fact or during the course of the project to reform the contract to say, it really meant, this is what it meant, because we both had this mutual mistake I want to enforce it. I want to, even though it could be, they could argue it's unenforceable, but I want, but I've done the work, so I've performed services for you. I want to reform the contract to ultimately mean what the parties are doing. And that may include the need for parole evidence. You know, you had this discussion, it's residential zoning, meeting of the minds, and everything else, but now we find out after the fact that you had this discussion where you said, God, I thought the area was industrial, and you can bring that in. It never was in the contract. You can bring evidence after the fact you learned it's industrial, but you've had exchange of letters after the fact saying it should be $175,000. So you have these reasons, mutual mistake or fraud or whatever, that you should reform the base terms of the contract. You should be paid the $175,000. So it's not a change order, it's not a modification. Everything else is the exact same. It's just a reformation for the terms of the contract as to what it's supposed to be. Does that make sense?